Um, there's all different ways to interpret this. I actually added three skulls, one for each of the, uh, the lads in Green Day. One here, one there, and you can't see it, but one's there. I showed it to, to Bill and, and, and Trey and Mike, and Billy Joe said, well, how long did this take you to make it? How, you know, that's it's so complicated. How long did it take you to make it? I said, well, I've been, I said, you know, a couple of weeks here, and then uh, I've been working on it for 36 hours, uh, and I just brought it here. He said, you didn't sleep? You, you haven't, you, you've been working for 36 hours without a break? I said, yeah, it's, it's okay, I'm an insomniac. I never sleep. And he said, oh, wow. <laughs> so later on, I was surprised to see when the, the record came out, they changed the title to Insomniac. And I thought, well, I wonder if that has anything to do with it. Although maybe not. I, I, I don't know. But uh, um, <laughs> it'd be a, a, a wild coincidence if it weren't. With songs like Walking Contradiction, the band tackled the question of whether they could sing about frustration, anger, and despair now that they were 20-something millionaire rock stars. So, could fans still identify with them? I think the process of becoming wealthy probably had less impact on their songwriting um, than just getting older did. And you get older, life changes. And you, when you start out playing in a band, you probably don't have a wife, you probably don't have kids, you probably don't own anything that's worth much. Um, those things come with age, whether you try or not. Um, and it's going to change what you think about. And when you change what you think about, you're going to write about different things. But they're different people. You know, they're grown-ups now. They have wives and children and stuff. And they're still writing songs that very young fans relate to. I mean, obviously they do. They're selling a lot of records to young people. So clearly they're able to write songs that people can identify with. Green Day was never about doing the expected, and they wanted to remember why they got into music in the first place. Nimrod marked a change of direction for the band. Nimrod is, is a harder album, is a more upbeat album for, from Insomniac, and it really is a response to Insomniac. And they've always said that it's the kind of music that they play in their practice hall. It's the kind of music that they play you know, when no one's around. And um, in an interview that I did with Billy Joe, he said, this is the album I've wanted to make ever since we've, we've started the band. I always wondered when I was going to get around to our London calling, this is it. So they think that's their London calling. Um, it's the one that puts them in a whole different stratosphere because they have the song Good Riddance, The Time of Your Life, which again got people saying, hey, they're sellouts. But it really is like a reflection of who they are. Nimrod really marked a change in the band um, to the general public. Um, and the punk community as well because of um, time of your life. A lot of people said that, you know, that they were sellouts because they're playing, you know, an acoustic song. But Mike has been quoted as saying, I think it's like the most punk thing that they could have done. If you took it out of the acoustic setting and really amped it up, it would be a Green Day song. You know, they just slowed it down. And he has said, and they've all said, that you could play any Green Day album on an acoustic guitar. And that's just what they did with that. They just tweaked it and, you know, slowed it down. It just seemed like after that song was released, it was on um, every, everything and everywhere, you know, for that, that year. It probably made them uh, extremely popular. Um, got a lot of people that didn't necessarily listen to Green Day um, into them. Um, but the true fans, um, really stuck stuck with the band. Probably. Okay. <laughs> Hello? This is the news. Hi. Um, so are you guys excited to be here tonight? What's, what's going on with you guys here? What are you up to? Oh, we're just here right now and uh, uh, hanging out, having a good time, drinking beer. Um, got nominated for a couple things. Maybe we'll win. Most likely we won't. It should be fun. <laughs> You're going to be okay if you don't win or if you do? 
I'm going to be just heartbroken. Been there. <laughs> been there. We are, we've been already, I have enough football trophies at home to hold me over. I'm fine. <laughs> All the craziness coming. Okay, um, here are any new projects coming up? Any new videos? What's that? Any new uh, songs, albums, videos coming up? Maybe we put, I think we're putting out another single for Hitchin' a Ride. Is, or not Hitchin' a Ride. That was the first one. Nice guys finished nice guys last. Finished last. Yeah. So. That's the first song on Imrod, though, so it's easy to confuse. As the band were about to set off on a major tour to promote Nimrod, it was evident that they still had that quintessential punk rock streak. They're totally naughty. There's this really funny story. When they were recording Nimrod, they were staying at this West Hollywood hotel, um, Sunset Marquee, where everybody stays. And I think they were there for some awards show. And they were staying, I think, on the third floor. And on the second floor was um, Juliette Binoche, who had just won the Academy Award for the Best Supporting Actress. And she was complaining about the noise level. They were just being really raucous. So the, um, the hotel staff asked them to keep it down a couple of times. So just as, the, as their gift to her, Mike Dirt you know, dropped his trousers, stuck his butt over the, the railing and, you know, <laughs> defecated on, on her, her lanai. And he'll admit it, and it's a really hilarious story, and she tried to get them thrown out, but they wouldn't throw out. So it's kind of that kind of punk spirit, the one that you see, like, like Blink-182 calling their albums Enema of the State. I mean, there's got to be some kind of correlation between, between feces and punk rock. And Mike being accident-prone, too, is legendary. They played this show at a club in San Francisco called The Bottom of the Hill that was filmed for MTV. And um, Mike got so wound up in what he was doing, he ended up smashing himself in the face with his headstock of his bass and breaking his known nose. He's kind of accident prone though. I mean, he got his teeth knocked out on stage at Woodstock. Had to be shipped, they had to cancel half a tour because he was having heart problems. Um, I think I asked him at one point if uh, he didn't think that he could find a safer <laughs> line of work. He was singing and he was like really getting into it and, and he, his mic stand swung out and hit him back, hit him in the mouth. And there he was again with a bloody mouth continuing on with the show until it just got too much for him and they brought someone up to, to take over for him. Thankfully, no permanent harm was done. And throughout the remainder of 1999, the band began to work on their next album, Warning. John Lou Casey, owner of Studio 880, worked closely with them. From the first day they rolled in, Trey was definitely the card. You know, uh, first thing is we had a less than adequate TV in the lounge, which ended up going off the roof, and it just goes smashing to the ground. And I look up and there's Trey, and so I give him this just like, what in the hell are you doing, look? And he just kind of looks at me and says, hi, that's it. And so I said, okay, we're in for one hell of a ride. You know, so Mike is a, is a totally different character. He's like, you know, he's, he's very intense. It's like he's had 30 cups of coffee and two espressos to boot all the time. And that's when he just wakes up in the morning. Billy Joe, however, he, he's an awesome guy. He's really into his family. And he's very quiet, you know, he's into his own space, you know. So he wasn't destructive or anything like that, but we were definitely on Trey alert the whole time that they were at the studio. Trey definitely fits in. I mean, he's not the same as the two of them. I mean, he's, a, he's a, a, like a live wire. He's like a loose cannon. He's a guy that you absolutely do not know what he's going to do. But somehow they keep him under control. I mean, Billy's got this thing called the look. I mean, it's as it's, it's mean as a Robert De Niro look. But, you know, the, the minute that things get a little out of control, I mean, he kind of flashes them a look and they know he means business. I mean, it's all done with love, of course. <laughs> Trey has left us big stuffed fish. Got a marlin, got a swordfish, got a barracuda from Trey. Um, I got a puffer fish from Trey, and they're all decorated in the studio game rooms and lounges. I have, uh, like I say, graffiti on the walls from Trey and quarters stuck to the floor. I had the second engineer, his name's Tone, okay? Well, he was working with them, and Trey was in the lounge, and he was on the internet, and he was just going through this crazy site. It was just all dominatrix, you know, sites. And he goes, yeah, we should get one to beat the hell out of Tone. So I just jokingly said to, to, to Trey, I said, hey, why don't you tell him, <laughs> Why don't you tell him 
If he doesn't take the beating, he doesn't get an album credit.